terrific. Welcome, everyone. This is my name is Christine Toriason. I am with FHI 360, normally based in North Carolina, but uh, today I'm in Lesotho, uh, where I am very happily participating in a study training for the Catalyst study. But taking a break to join you all here for the Global Prep Learning Network, um, and this uh, is hosted by the Mosaic Project, which is funded by PEPFAR through USAID. So we're very glad to have you today. We would uh, ask that you go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat. Please do select everyone when you uh, use the chat function so that everyone can see your questions and answers. Unfortunately, we do not have the option for attendees to speak, but um, we are happy for you to put comments or questions in the chat and we will respond uh, either in the chat or, or during the Q&A session for our session today. So I think I'd like to go ahead and move forward with our agenda and introductions. So uh, we are going to talk today about choice in HIV prevention. Um, and we're delighted to have a number of different speakers. If you can go to the next slide, I'll introduce them. So we are very pleased to have Han Khan with us today, who is the director of the Office of HIV AIDS at the Bureau for Global Health at USAID. And Han is a senior level officer with the US Foreign Service who has served in a number of different countries and previously worked for the CDC um, uh, as well as uh, in HIV AIDS care and clinics uh, earlier in his career. I also get to introduce myself. So I'm the Mosaic Project Director at FHI 360 and I am um, a pediatrician and also a global health expert who is working in HIV prevention and product introduction. Next slide. So I'm pleased to introduce Margaret Akini Atianio from LVCT Health in Kenya. Margaret is a Mosaic Next Gen Squad member and a SRH and gender youth advocate who is committed to promoting health and well being of fellow young people. Katie Williams joins us from FHI 360 in the US. She's a technical officer who is supporting the Mosaic team with product introduction work and family planning. Um, and works primarily on our policy and program uh, work streams. Next slide, please. Adobe Lisa Olisa joins us from FHI 360 Nigeria. She is also a Next Gen Squad member of the Mosaic Project, as well as being a pharmacist who's worked on multiple projects uh, and authored a number of different ab abstracts and most recently participated in the CROI conference in Seattle as a community scholar. Navita Jane joins us from AVAC. She is a senior program manager on the research engagement team and supports the CASPER project, which is also a USAID funded award. Uh, her role is to strengthen advocacy for women's health and prevention, um, uh, as well as work in HIV and SRH integration. Next slide, please. We're pleased to have Yvette Raphael with us today, who's an executive director of Advocates for the Prevention of HIV in Africa. Yvette is a leader in the fight against HIV and a woman who has been living with HIV for over 19 years. Uh, she is a globally renowned advocate of effective and efficient education to the community regarding new and developing research for medications that treat and or prevent HIV. We also welcome Joyce Nanga, from AFNI and Waki Health. She's a policy advisor and coordinator with many years of experience champion healthy communities, particularly for adolescent girls and young women. Next slide. Okay. Well, we get to start today with an overview of the PrEP product pipeline, and then we're going to move into um, some comments from um, Hong Kong and uh, overview of the choice principles and the choice manifesto, and we'll follow that with some discussion. So I have the privilege of talking to you about the pipeline. We thought before we talk about choice in HIV prevention, we should um, refresh ourselves on what is currently in the HIV prevention toolkit and pipeline. So thanks to AVAC for this slide. You see over on the left, we have a number of HIV prevention options currently available. These include um, treatment with viral suppression, male and female condoms, voluntary medical male circumcision, syringe exchange programs, and daily or event-driven oral prep. 
Uh, we have some newly approved and recommended options, such as the depibrin vaginal ring and long-acting injectable cabotegravir for PrEP. And there are a number of other products that are in development. Um, however, very few of those are actually in efficacy trials. Um, one of those that is currently in the efficacy trial is long-acting injectable lenacapavir for PrEP. Uh, and then there are also combination oral PrEP and, and uh, contraceptive products. So I'm going to talk today, I'm just going to give a, a little bit of a deeper dive into the products that are closest to being entering the market. And this includes oral PrEP, the ring, cabotegravir, lenacapavir, and the dual prevention pill. But you can see in the pipeline for preclinical and clinical development that there are a number of other prevention products uh, with different formulations, be they implants, uh, inserts, films, gels, et cetera, that are uh, currently in early stages of investigation. Next slide. Okay, so this is just a brief refresher on oral prep, tenofovir-based oral prep. Uh, so while we have seen great progress um, in oral PrEP initiations, which have now reached more than 3.8 million globally, there is still a high unmet need for HIV prevention with 38, over 38 million people living with HIV and one and a half million people becoming newly infected each year. Oral PrEP was initially approved by the U.S. Um, Food and Drug Administration in 2012, and then uh, WHO released normative guidance in 2015. And the first African regulatory approvals were um, came through in 2016. We now have daily and event-driven oral dosing for men and daily oral dosing for women. And there have been a lot of innovations for oral prep uh, through multi-month dispensing and community-based delivery, especially uh, lessons learned with the COVID pandemic. But we still have substantial challenges with adherence and continuation with this prep option. And so we are keenly interested in other prep options that could fill the gap uh, of meeting the needs of individuals for HIV prevention. So let's talk about some of those other new options. So the depivirine vaginal ring is a vaginal ring that releases depivirine over one month. It is a flexible silicone vaginal ring. It was developed by the International Partnership for Microbicides, which is now an affiliate of the Population Council. It's a woman-initiated woman product that is self-inserted and lasts for one month. It's non-systemic. Uh, so it protects only for receptive vaginal sex. Uh, the depivirine ring uh, has gone through safety and efficacy trials that showed about a 35% effectiveness in the ring study and 27% in the Aspire study and had a very strong safety profile. The open label extension studies saw that increased adherence led to uh, increased levels of effectiveness with um, the estimate that the ring is more than 50% effective with consistent use. There are also some exploratory analyses looking at very um, highly adherent participants in the studies that estimate that that effectiveness could be as high as 75 to 91% uh, with uh, greater than four milligrams of depivirine release compared to placebo. The ring uh, does not require cold chain and has a very long half-life of five years. Next slide. So this is the current regulatory strat status for ring. It was recommended uh, for cisgender women age 18 and older by the WHO in 2021. Uh, however, um, IPM withdrew their US FDA application uh, once they realized that um, they received feedback that current data are unlikely to support US approval given the HIV prevention landscape for women in the US. It has been approved by multiple regulatory bodies in Africa. However, um, many of those have not, uh, have not at this point moved forward with RAIN rollout, even though they have regulatory approval. Uh, the 2022 PEPFAR guidance initially allowed for RAIN procurement for program delivery, but then they changed their guidance to, um, to support procurement for research only and to procure service provision but not um, range for program. However, we do know that the Global Fund plans to support procurement of prep ring for program delivery um, through its uh, current renewals that are underway. And there are multiple planned implementation studies that include prep ring. And we hope that the data from those studies will help move um, uh, 
answer some of the questions and move uh, rain closer to market introduction. Next slide, please. Injectable cabotegravir for PrEP. Uh, it was developed by Vive Healthcare, and it is an intramuscular injection with the antiretroviral drug cabotegravir. It's long-acting. Uh, it involves a three milliliter injection administered to the gluteal muscle every two months. It also has a long pharmacologic drug tail uh, lasting one year or longer. It was shown to be uh, more effective than Truvada in reducing HIV risk in phase three trials. These are the HPTN-083 and HPTN-084 trials. Um, and uh, open label extension studies are ongoing with more information being collected uh, about its use um, during adolescence and pregnancy, as well as uh, up around what happens during the drug tail. Next slide, please. So cabotegravir was approved by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration for the prevention of HIV in, in 2021 and was recommended by the WHO for HIV prevention in 2022. Um, and it has been approved by national regulatory authorities in Australia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. It's currently under regulatory review in a number of other countries, and we anticipate further submissions. Uh, Vivo, we, Vivo will submit uh, additional dossiers to other countries in the coming months. Price negoti negotiations have been underway at a global level for this product without a publicly released price at the moment uh, for low and middle income markets. Um, and there are plans for voluntary licensing to allow for generic manufacturing and sale. Um, the main issue right now with injectable cab is that the actual supply available for low and middle income markets is really limited uh, due to manufacturing constraints and it will take a number of years before generic manufacturers can come in and fill that space uh, so um, there are um, discussions underway right now about how to prioritize the limited supply of cab prep available uh, in the coming year or two uh, at the same time there are a number of implementation research projects that are underway or soon to be underway that will include CAB. Next slide. So injectable lenacapavir for PrEP is a subcutaneous injection uh, and it is being developed by Gilead and it is a six monthly injection. Um, lenacapavir was already approved by the US FDA for treatment for multi-drug resistant HIV infection. And there are now two phase three trials underway uh, to see if it it would be safe and effective to be used for prevention. So the purpose one trial is a double blind randomized study uh, looking at lenacapavir and FTAF in adolescent girls and young women. The purpose two trial is evaluating the same two products in cis and trans men and gender non-binary people. Uh, we anticipate results from these safety and efficacy trials um, may be forthcoming next year or the year after. Next slide. Finally, I just wanted to make a mention of the dual prevention pill, which is an oral pill that could prevent both HIV and pregnancy, and it's being developed by Viatris as a co-formulated product. You can see an example of what it might look like in a blister pack to the right. Um, both both uh, of the um, medications within this product are already approved by multiple regulatory bodies for a single indication, meaning levonogestrel for contraception and DDF-FTC for HIV prevention. But in the in the combined co-formulated product, they are conducting bioequivalent studies to see if um, they can be used together and they need to do stability testing as well. Uh, so we don't know exactly when we'll have those results either or how the FDA will view um, the bioequivalent studies, but we hope to have results next year or the year after. Next slide. So this sort of summation of uh, the review of this product pipeline is that there is no perfect product. Every product has strengths and weaknesses and choice would allow users to move through different products and find the product that best fits their individual need. And really the best prevention product for HIV is the one that an individual can use effectively when needed. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we've, think that a multi-method market will help us achieve impact because it will allow for greater coverage uh, across more individuals who can find a product that fits their lives best. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Hong Kong for some comments and reflections uh, from USAID on choice and HIV prevention. Over to you, Hong. Thank you very much, Christine. First of all, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone on this call. It's great to be with all of you, and I hope that there's an opportunity sometime in the near future where we could all gather in person. Now, this call is taking place at a really important time in the month of March, which is Women's History Month. And I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of the women who participate in the trials leading to the development of the multi-product market, which includes oral prep, the brain ring, and then also CAD prep as well as options. Also, just wanted to take an opportunity to shout out the youth advocates who are part of the Next Gen Squad. Margaret and Adobe, I see that both of you are on the panel as speakers and really appreciate connecting with both of you and actually meeting other Next Gen Squad members in South Africa. And I just had an opportunity to really learn more from them about how all of you meaningfully engage young people in research and research utilization. I'm also just wanted to take a moment to recognize the HIV prevention ambassadors in Zimbabwe who continue to help adolescent girls and young women uh, to remain free from HIV. And this is the kind of youth engagement that we really need in order to further and advance our shared goals around HIV prevention. It, the work that the Next Gen Squad and the HIV Prevention Ambassadors really reflects the social service workforce. And the month of March is also special because it is also World Social Work Month. And I think that for many of the people who were interested in reaching their first point of contact with the health system or the social service system may actually be a social worker. So I think it's important for us to acknowledge the role that social workers play um, in HIV prevention and service delivery. Now, I just returned from two weeks of co-planning meetings that the State Department convened to prepare the two-year PEPFAR operational plans. What was most exciting to me from those meetings was really having the opportunity to engage with youth, both through town halls involving the ambassador, Ambassador Kambisong, and also the youth panels that were part of the plenary sessions. And in my interactions with the youth and other stakeholders, there really were two takeaways that I just wanted to share with all of you as it pertains to what we're discussing today. One is that we should all celebrate our collective progress beyond the programs that we implement. In particular, we had an opportunity to review our results from October through the end of December. So this constitutes quarter one of the U.S. government's fiscal year 2023. And I was just amazed to see that we have reached nearly 200,000 people to initiate PrEP just in these three months. And this accomplishment represents 30% of our annual target. And we see very similar levels of accomplishment among key and priority populations, as well as adolescent girls and young women. So there's certainly evidence of just continued increasing demand for PrEP through our HIV programming. And certainly as USAID, as an implementing agency for PEPFAR, we certainly support the UNAID's goal of having 10 million people on PrEP globally by 2025. The second takeaway that I wanted to share with all of you is that in order to really maximize impact, we really need to do two things. One is we need to expand. And what I mean by that is just being able to offer additional options for people to use based on the principles of volunteerism and informed choice. And these principles certainly come from the family planning space. We're very excited to be a part of this effort to develop new prevention products. And I'm just certainly excited to hear more about Lena Capavir and the dual prevention tool. And as Christy mentioned, 
by offering these additional products, we can collectively increase our prevention coverage. And we can also just make the prevention programming much more person oriented and person centered because we're actually giving greater choice for people and based on what works best for them. When I use the word integrate, what I mean by this is really referring to the provision of prevention through services in clinical and community settings that have the greatest reach of our target populations. So the dual prevention tool in particular offers an opportunity for us to really strengthen our integration with family planning. And I recall a conversation that I had with Mitch about how really by having this kind of integration, we can reach even more um, adolescent girls and young women, especially those um, and other women of reproductive age. The other opportunity that we should look into is how to better incorporate the offer of these prevention products through primary care. And also for us to acknowledge that the way that a primary care may be delivered from now into the future will look very different from the way in which primary care has been delivered to date. I think with the advent of HIV self-testing, the push for status neutral testing approaches, I think it really reinforces the need for us to offer a greater variety of services and products to reach the greatest number of people in the most accessible ways. So I really look forward to it, learning more from all of you, engaging with all of you in terms of how we can really design and implement a primary care approach that incorporates the wider choice of HIV prevention products that are under development. So Christine, back to you. Thank you so much for those comments, Han. That was terrific. Um, we're going to move now to hear about the choice principles, and I'm going to turn it over to Katie Williams to launch that discussion. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, hi, my name is Katie Williams with FHI 360, and I'm here to give a brief background on our recently developed choice principles for HIV prevention, after which, um, as Christine and Han have mentioned, my co-authors, Adobe and Margaret, members of our Mosaic Next Gen Squad, will walk us through the principles and our suggested examples of the principles in practice. Uh, next slide, please. So as many of us here today are aware and have vocalized, the calls for choice are growing much louder as, the, as more options enter the HIV prevention landscape. However, in expanding the number of options or methods available, it hasn't necessarily ensured choice for users at the receiving end. And in fact, with some of this thinking, we've posited that by expanding our options as a means of achieving PrEP uptake targets, which are key in our field, um, the field in itself has un inadvertently underinvested in factors that actually promote, protect, and centralize choice in that process. Uh, and so in doing so, if you'll hit tap through next slide briefly, please. Um, we really think we need to recognize how options and choice are distinct elements of the HIV prevention environment. We've defined them here um, as this is how we've used them in the creation of our choice principles. Um, and really the key to all of this is understanding that options enable choice. We need both, uh, but we need to understand how they work with one another in order to centralize choice in all of our outcomes. Next slide. And next slide, thank you. Uh, so in response, this uh, wonderful core team of representatives from the Mosaic Consortium convened to develop discrete principles for choice in HIV prevention that are really meant to guide and inform both global and country level stakeholders in new prevention product introduction efforts. And I think as Han outlined, these principles um, really are meant to offer a framework around operationalizing that progress and commitment to choice that Han covered in the expansion of PrEP products. Next slide. So through a literature review and then a validation process um, heavily led with our uh, Next Gen Squad members, we developed a set of eight core principles that recognize and reaffirm the role of choice in the right to health for HIV prevention. These principles have been informed by other existing frameworks on choice. We know we're not in a vacuum here. Uh, we drew heavily from human rights, from family planning and quality of care and patients' rights fields. 
Um, and importantly, as I mentioned, they've really been developed in collaboration with young people. We've captured all of this motivation, the process, the principles uh, in a viewpoint that excitingly will be available in the April issue of Lancet HIV. So stay tuned uh, for that. The next slide. Uh, and so again, just in brief, these are eight principles. Our next gen squad members will walk through them in more detail. Uh, but they're again intended to be universal and applicable across multiple levels of the health system by really concretizing what choice looks like at those different levels and offering che checkpoints of accountability by contextualizing what opportunities look like, what barriers look like to supporting choice and practice. So I will hand it over to Adobe and Margaret, um, again, integral members of this team and to walk us through our principles. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Kitty. Um I'm going to take us through the choice in principles, uh, the first four. And the first one is uh, non-discrimination, uh, which, uh, as an inscription in that case, the reputation market should allow individual choice of whether to use any method and what prevention option to use at any given time in a manner that is voluntary and free of discrimination, coercion, or violence. An example in practice is that policy makers, researchers, program implementers, and donors to operate with awareness of societal barriers to racial prevention and pursue policies and practices that circumvent those barriers to avoid discrimination. Next slide. The second uh, choice principle is the principle of availability. Description is that uh, uh, the widest potential array of viable HIV prevention options, supplies, and equipment should be in stock for you to in a specific market. Uh, a clear example is that prevention methods are intentionally considered in a product introduction planning, especially as integrated and differentiated service delivery continues to expand across the health sector. Uh, so it's very important to have those, um, uh, the products available. Next slide. Uh, the third principle is the principle of accessibility where HIV prevention markets support individual choice without physical, co-based interpersonal or informal barriers or whether restrictions to access. An example in practice is that uh, prevention methods are obtainable in a specific market and that they are available at affordable prices through preferred service delivery channels without discouragement by healthcare providers or limitation, or limitation on hours of access or barriers to information. Next slide. Uh, the fourth principle is the principle of acceptability. Uh, this one means that HIV prevention markets are gender sensitive and person centered first based on medically accurate and comprehensive information and responsive to market demand. An example in practice is that methods meet the spectrum of user preferences and needs which change over time and vary by individual users. Looking at it uh, is that uh, are these products acceptable to my needs and why? So next I'm going to hand it over to Adobe, who will be taking us through uh, the remaining principles. Adobe, over to you. Thank you, Maggie. So the fifth principle is principle of quality, which states that HIV prevention markets include options and services, both technical and interpersonal, that are of the highest possible quality and product are quality assured. An example of this in practice would be that individuals receive services from adequately trained service providers who can provide specialized services to meet their unique needs in both HIV specific and integrated service delivery settings. Just like Hankan mentioned, we should integrate services and deliver high quality services. Next slide, please. So the principle of privacy and confidentiality states that HIV prevention markets should protect and uphold the privacy of individuals, including the confidentiality of medical and other personal information. An example of this will be that individuals are reassured that no personal information about their HIV status, their choices or preferences 
is shared with anyone but necessary medical professionals. Now, we have learned from the implementation of oral prep that the level of discretion actually influences uptake and also continuation of um, prep. So this principle is really important. Next slide, please. Participation. This principle states that HIV prevention markets meaningfully and inclusively engage communities, particularly people directly affected by HIV, in all aspects of HIV prevention research, program and policy design, implementation and monitoring, and are adaptive to how these communities may change over time. An excellent example of this will be the Catalyst study, which engages, which is meaningfully engaging the Mosaic Next Gen Squad, a group of youth advocates across nine African countries. I'm a proud member of the Mosaic Next Gen Squad. Shout out to my colleagues on the call today. And together we contribute to the planning, the implementation, and also the dissemination of results from the Catalyst study to ensure that the study reflects the perspectives and lived experiences of adolescent girls and young women in all our diversity. And it's also important to note that the CROI conference, Insights from CROI, emphasized the need to include the pregnant and breastfeeding population in research as their exclusion from research over time had led to limited um, data for them, which limits or delays um, access to interventions for that population. Next slide, please. And the last principle, accountability. It states that HIV prevention markets have accountability mechanisms in place to respond to communities and clients' feedback at all levels of the market. An example of this in practice would be that clear and appropriate accountability mechanisms are in place for violation of these principles, such as pharmacovigilance for counterfeit products and reporting of misconduct by healthcare professionals. Now, this principle is important because it will help and to ensure that um, accountable mechanisms are in place, feedback mechanisms are in place for quality improvement as implementation continues. Next slide, please. And so we're saying that if these principles are upheld, then individuals will have the autonomy, the knowledge and the freedom from coercion at any given time to select the best method for them among options in a specific market. Thank you so much. At this point, I'll hand it over to the next set of presenters who will be speaking on the Choice Manifesto. Thank you so much, Adobe, Margaret, and Katie for that overview of the Choice Principles. And I'm now pleased to hand this over to Joyce, Yvette, and Anita, and Navita for the Choice Manifesto. Thank you so much, Christine, and, and thank you to the presenters for really setting the stage um, and for your commitment to choice. I'm very excited to, to join this group and to showcase how advocates have been working for years around choice. And I'm also really lucky to be presenting alongside my colleagues, Yvette and Joyce, who are two very fierce advocates who, who I'm sure many on um, this call have, have seen and met um, to outline the choice manifesto. Um, can you next slide? We all collaborate through our work under the Coalition to Accelerate and Support Prevention Research, or CASPER, and are here representing the coalition as well as our individual organizations, APA, Wacky Health, and AVAC, as well as the work of the African Women Community Prevention Accountability Board. Um, next slide. The board came together last year when pushing for transparency around plans for injectable, pre uh, injectable CAB and are now working on bringing the choice manifesto into focus. Advocacy under Casper is about working together to really translate options into choice, and this includes all options, as demonstrated through many of these pictures um, that you see here. Advocacy for all products, those that are long and short acting, systemic and non-systemic, and are user controlled, and are included but not limited at all to oral prep, the ring and cab, are really key components of the work under Casper as is advocating for sexual and reproductive health integration. Our work is not about any one product, but really empowering individuals to make choices. 
This isn't new because we have Ring or Cab, but it really builds on a very long history of work done by advocates. Next slide. Thank you. So this slide really illustrates the history of advocacy, specifically looking at um, Cab for Prep. And there is absolutely no need to strain your eyes to read the details um, on the slide. Uh, the point is really uh, to demonstrate the robust engagement by advocates from the clinical research process through to regulatory approvals and going into introduction of the product. It includes um, a few things that are included here are consultations that were led by advocates, high level meetings at key conferences where advocates really pushed for the agenda around a number of different products and the inclusion of advocates as, uh, as partners and as, um, as side by side in really developing and policy making decisions um, that, that were related to cap for prep. As you can see, the history goes back many years and a similar slide going back even further could also be shown for the Depivirine vaginal ring or any number of products as advocates have really been at the forefront of advocacy and engagement that make prevention options a reality. Advocacy and engagement is not just about the product on the market, but about long-term sustainable engagement from research and development all the way through to delivery. Next slide. So we heard earlier from Katie about the connection between options and choice, and it's really worth reiterating that moving from biomedical options to choices requires strong programs and really requires that policymakers, donors, government, and implementers make method mix available, accessible, and affordable. Everyone says that we want choice, but support for choice, collaboration, and coordination are really needed to actually make this happen. And so I'm very happy to um, share the draft manifesto as it really brings us one step closer to this. And I'm happy to turn it over to my colleague, Joyce, to share the guiding principles. Thank you, Lavita. Next slide. As I make this presentation, I'm quite cognizant that I'm standing on the shoulders of women, strong women advocates who came before us. Um, on this advocacy for HIV prevention among women and also standing on very powerful shoulders, again, of young women, emerging advocates who are very powerful and strong in voice in calling for an end to new HIV infections among adolescent girls and young women and really proud to see that young women are here leading on this webinar today and speaking very powerfully about choice and the choice prevention principle. So I'm going to kind of continue from where the young ladies um, have left it and say that the Women's HIV Prevention Choice Manifesto has been developed by African women in their diversity, uh, feminists, HIV prevention advocates across Southern and Eastern Africa. We are united in calling for continued political and financial support for HIV prevention choice, which includes the introduction and rollout of safe and effective options, including long-acting HIV prevention options and tools, as has been said on this call. Biomedical HIV prevention, um, I would say, is at a historic turning point but only if countries and funders hit evidence-based demand that programs must emphasize choice, not individual products, and that research and development for new choices, both user-dependent and long-acting. Next slide, please. We have the choice uh, guiding principles, which also are very much aligned with uh, HIV prevention choice principles as we have heard, and I'm going to highlight some of these. So we are looking at a future free of HIV for our daughters, our sisters, our aunties, and women at large in Africa. A HIV prevention agenda that includes choice among both prevention options and programs for women and girls to prevent HIV as they navigate through the different stages and circumstances of their life as we are aware that this keeps changing from time to time and as such is good to provide options and choices that um, women can use as, 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 as their lives changes and, and they find their, themselves in different circumstances. 
a HIV prevention agenda that focuses, invests, and prioritizes adolescent girls and young women in Africa and of African descent across the world, and HIV prevention agenda that puts women and girls at the center and forefront, and not only for research, but also for access to products that are shown to be safe and effective, and HIV prevention choice agenda that is conceptualized by the community and responds to the needs of the communities and not the donors and not um, any other people. Um, a HIV prevention agenda that follows the science and uses epidemiological evidence to make options available to women and girls who are vulnerable to HIV prevention. Next slide, please. And the call to action as illustrated by the Choice Manifesto is that center people and communities. Prioritize the key and marginalized population and skill interventions targeting them while addressing other social determinants to access like stigma and discrimination and criminal criminalization. Ensure that research and development and delivery are informed by communities in alignment with a good participatory practice. Um, and there's a guideline to that to refer to. It is imperative that communities inform the ongoing and future pipeline from the onset design and formulation, as well as the introduction of proven intervention. Choice is key. Ensure massive scale up and increase access to all safe and effective HIV prevention methods. Ensure women have control over their health and their body and access to a full range of safe and effective options so that they can choose what works best for them at different times and circumstances of their life. Next slide, please. Programs that deliver um, integration for HIV prevention into all other services that are required. For example, family planning, cervical cancer prevention, antenatal care, postnatal care, um, and ensure easy access and availability of such prevention methods, support, prioritize, and finance interventions to prevent sexually transmitted infection among adolescent girls and young women who are especially vulnerable to anatomical makeup, cultural, and traditional constraints that hinder negotiation for safer sex and adequate protection against STIs. Looking at the future, the current options are good, but not sufficient. Prioritize research and development of additional systemic and non-systemic options. All stakeholders, they need to strategize, staff, budget, and procure for choice-based HIV prevention. It is not enough just to have options, just to have products, to have uh, calls to action statements, and even this choice manifesto if the choice agenda is not going to be financed. Um, it means then there'll be no access to choice. Next slide, please, as I call my colleague Yvette um, to do the last or next steps. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Joyce. And first, uh, I'd like to um, also thank all the previous speakers, everyone who's spoken and spoken very powerfully around choice, especially the Gen Squad, the new generation. And I can safely say, Joyce, me and you agree, the future for women advocacy for research and development surely looks safe. And as we remember that this is Women's Month, as, as was mentioned before, it's important that we must never forget that women have always been the greatest allies to humanity. And it is time for society, time for everyone. I see the 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 participants on this call are over 200. It's time for us to commit and for us to show up for women. And, um, you know, as, as we talk, we, we must remember that also we must commit for, uh, to this choice agenda. We must ensure that it becomes a reality. We must not only make sure it becomes a reality, but we also need to ensure that we commit resources and finances to make sure it becomes a, real, a reality. I would like to say, we have been consulted. We have been spoken to Joyce. We, we had so many meetings. Now is the time to make it a reality. And our ultimate goal in this is to 
to ensure there's an urgent and quick sign on to the manifesto by decision makers, scientists, civil society, global and regional donors. Finalize our next step is also to finalize the manifesto dissemination plan and accompanying activities. There will be a lot of activities to ensure that this uh, manifesto reaches every corner of the globe. Call for signatures. We will send out a call for signatures, signatories, our allies all across the world. And we will soon be launching the Choice Manifesto led by the UNA Executive Director, Comrade Winnie Bianima in Uganda with key partners and the African Women's Prevention Community Accountability Board. For you to get involved, it's easy. Please email yvetrafael at apa.org.za or uh, Comrade uh, Joyce uh, at joyce at wakhiel.org. But I think, Joyce, we did a... A, an, a stunning job in consultation. What needs to happen now is action. What we needs to happen now, it's the the blah blah has to stop. We have to ensure the choice becomes a reality. We owe it to the Gen Squad. Everyone owes it to the young people to ensure when they go to a, a healthcare facility, there is a choice that is offered for them and it's affordable and available. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Yvette, Joyce, and Davida. I think it's, you know, we've we've seen here um, tremendous commitment from USAID for the idea of choice in HIV prevention. We've heard about uh, a set of principles to guide choice. And now we've heard about the choice manifesto with uh, strong and, and what the what can be achieved through um, strong advocacy and community engagement. Uh, so I, we have um, a few minutes to take some questions. So we, I think there are a few things in the chat I can reflect on. And also, if you would like to speak, even though you're muted right now, we could unmute you. So you can raise your hand if you would like to speak. I do just before I uh, go to a few questions, I wanted to highlight the tools. Previous slide, please. Um, we do have a few um, tools that we have developed to support choice in, in HIV prevention, specifically for PrEP. Uh, these include the PrEP Tool Finder, which is available on PrepWatch, the HIV Prevention User Journey Tool, uh, which helps in counseling around different prevention options, the uh, Oral PrEP, um, PrEP Brain and Cab PrEP Template Guidelines, which can be used to help um, national governments uh, 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 update their guidelines for choice, and the HIV Prevention Ambassador Training Package. So I think um, some of those links can be put in the chat. Um, I do see we have one hand up, um, and I need to go to the top to see that is that is Raymond. So if you'd like to be unmuted, Raymond, and speak, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. Hope you can hear me now. Good afternoon from me from Nigeria. Yeah. So my name is Ramon Olariwaju. I'm the national coordinator for Youth Network on HIV in Nigeria. Yeah. So, um, as a to the PEP for adolescent and young people, because as you really know, in Nigeria currently now, the global fund drive charging is actually, you know, going on presently, which I'm part of the national thing that is working on that. And, you know, one of the things that we are actually looking at for young people is the access to crime. Well, looking at the costs and some other effects of the Correct, more actually for young people that, you know, that don't actually present or that are not much vulnerable to HIV eat. So um, my question now is that, so how can we make PrEP to be more, more accessible and more available for every group, regardless of their background, sexual orientations and all of that? Because looking at, you know, every study, even mode of transmission, I've reviewed that, you know, even uh, not only key populations that are diverse of the epidemic now, so we have some other, you know, group that are also diverse of the epidemics now. I'm talking about Nigeria context now, so it might not be applicable to other countries. So making it to be accessible for young people have always become more, you know, challenging, looking at the cost and every other thing that is around it. So what can we do? So how can we make this available for young people? Because me, I believe that 
Conduct alone is not a prevention method for young people. Young people need to have multiple choice of prevention tools so that for them to be able to prevent HIV. So that's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that question, Ramon. And you raise a very important issue of costs that plays into accessibility. Um, I'm going to ask if someone on our panel would like to respond to Ramon's question. And you can either jump in or raise your hand and I'll call on you. Okay. Hi, Christine. This is Adobe. Thanks, and, Adobe. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Larry, for that question. I think we've worked on some things together in Nigeria. So the, like Christine has mentioned, the um, principle on accessibility actually highlights that donors consider cost effectiveness and advocate for subsidies to ensure in expanded access to methods without skewing the market towards specific, uh, towards specific methods. So we're advocating that donors, while they provide funding and also the government as well, they should try to enhance accessibility by considering cost effectiveness, reducing costs, trying to make the different products because if they are not cost effective or if they are not if clients are not able to afford them if they are not affordable then the choice is taken away from them so we are advocating that the products are affordable they are cost effective and donors and governments and everyone to work together to ensure that these products are accessible and um, affordable to clients. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Adobe. I see that we also have uh, Yusuf would like to make a comment and a question. Please go ahead, Yusuf. Um, thank you so much, Kristen. Um, I think my brother raised a critical question uh, because um, um, Nigerian context is actually different. And just like I've said the other time, Almost seventy percent of people in Nigeria access healthcare through also the informal uh, private sector. I think the one key reflection here I could give, and also a challenge, especially to AVAG and other partners, is actually to look around um, uh, more like a total market approach. We have seen um, Nigeria became a model for social business enterprise, um, running away from donor services and also from government uh, backing. We're trying to see like how do we influence market that also the private sector can drive sustainability. How do we ensure that primary healthcare, this informal private sector, drive integration? We have family planning, we have DSD, we have a lot of we have OSS. That how could those people feel safe? Because we have actually decentralized those key set care to clinical and hospital setting. But trying to have evidence as part of Mosaic, part of AP and all that thing. How do we actually shape the market to actually bring everyone into a cycle? Government play part in maybe social uh, behavioral SBCC, uh, maybe partners does in pooling and all those things. If we have them in those baskets, I think PEFA, what they are advocating, integration in service delivery and everything will be more easier. Um, just to also expand is to say, Hank actually gave an idea around maximizing impact, which we haven't been done. A lot of things are happening in supply chain for malaria and this and that. But trying to see if we actually um, address the structural inequalities around maybe stigma or other things. We saw Uganda, Kenya has issues around policy issues. They have issues around GBV or key things. So how do we see Africa not saying a one-size approach will work? But how do we see local services delivery can be leveraged? I think it will go a long way. So thank you and over. Thank you, Yusuf. Would any of our panelists like to respond to Yusuf's comments? We do have another hand raised, um, an attendee, Sibiwe. Okay. Go ahead, Sibiwe. I'm greetings. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, um, good morning, evening, and afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Kaika, and I am an upper ground force in South Africa. So speaking on accessibility and affordability, my question is based on the inclusion of adolescents in PrEP studies, because, and I'm speaking in the 
arena of South Africa because the adolescents here are more sexually active with little to no knowledge about prevention methods and PrEP and sexual health methods and all other factors that come into effect when one is sexually active. And that actually places them at a higher risk of HIV acquisition. So I just want to know what is being done to ensure that um, like small kids in rural areas who aren't like exposed to say television or the internet and whatsoever, what is being done to ensure that they also know about um, the choices that we have. They also know about PrEP. They also know about it and every other prevention methods that um, we as the kids that live, you know, in cities know about. Thank you. Thank you, Saviwe. Would one of our panelists like to respond? Okay, hi, Christine. I would like to respond. Thank you, Saviwe, for bringing that point up. Um, like I'm part of the Next Gen Squad, and I have colleagues in South Africa. We're working together on the Catalyst study. We're trying to, you know, find out things that influence the uptake and the use of PrEP things that limit people's access, is it cost, is it information? We're trying to, I think the Catalyst study is launching very soon in a couple of months, and it's going to also be in South Africa as well. So when we get all that information, then we will inform the policy makers, we will inform the um, implementers, we will inform the donors and everyone that this, this is the way to go, this is what is affecting the young people, and young people are also involved in this process. The Next Gen Squad were involved throughout the process, through the implementation, the planning, even the um, interpretation of the results and dissemination to ensure that the perspectives of young people are not skewed in the process. They are really out there the way it is in a safe environment. I hope that answers your question. I see Maggie also contribute as well. Please go ahead, Margaret. I wanted to tell him that one of the ways that we are implementing more right uh, is through the use of community advisory board, where it is a very diverse um, a board of uh, young people, uh, the PrEP users and child fields and advocates who are majorly are uh, the community voices, and that's where we are going to be able to reach individuals uh, within the community and also, also working with the community based organizations who also are directly involved in the delivery of uh, personal information around the PrEP uh, for young people in the community. So those are some of the ways that we are working to reach uh, the adolescent adults, young women within the community. Yeah, all that. Thank you, Margaret. Navida? Thank you. I think the second question was answered um, quite beautifully. I was just going to add to uh, Yusuf's point earlier, um, just to really reiterate that it's exactly the right point. And I think what we all are talking about on this call, really highlighting the fact that choice is about program choices that enable product choices and, and really ensuring that program choices are comprehensive and that we are we are looking at products and and programs that really address um, all people and in, in put communities first, but also looking at choices for women and women in all their diversity, um, really having uh, their ability to really have programs that work for them um, is so is so important. Thank you, Navita. Um, I think we are we're going to need to close. I know I saw one more hand in the chat, but I'd like to I'd like to give Han kind of a moment to say a few words, and I just thought I would summarize also briefly that, you know, I, a lot of the issues that have come up in the chat are around access and reach for these products. And we don't have, right now we don't have choice. And there are, are indeed a lot of challenges in the way of achieving choice uh, that include things uh, like cost, like um, uh, making these products available for all populations, including adolescents, uh, making them available in rural, city, rural settings, uh, decreasing stigma around HIV prevention. Um, so while we have put forth today and discussed choice principles and a choice manifesto, there is a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of challenges that need to be overcome to actually uh, bring 
these choice principles into pr into fruition for HIV prevention. Um, on that note, Han, do you want to say any final words before we close? Sure, Christine. First of all, really thanks to you and your team for convening all of us as part of this network. And I'm just glad that we found this community of practice to be able to have this exchange of both information and ideas on how we can really advance the progress in expanding choice and options for HIV prevention. The second is to recognize that while there's a lot of focus on, at least for USAID and for the PEPR community, to really drive progress toward the triple 95 UNAIDS targets, that our work um, in prevention also will contribute to these targets but also to the triple 10 targets that really relate to some of the structural barriers, Christine, that you identified, that key and priority population space that our adolescent girls and young women face in terms of accessing HIV, the, the range of HIV services. And so in order to really be able to offer the full variety and spectrum of services for all individuals, we need to make sure that everyone works and is able to be served in an environment where they're free from stigma and discrimination and from some of the the criminalization that happens to many of our target populations and so i really look forward to again working and liaising with all of you and learning from all of you and um, and look forward to further dialogue that we can have as part of this network and other communities of practice. Thank you so much, Han, and to all of our speakers today. Really appreciate your time and our attendees. We look forward to joining again in, in about three months for our next PrEP Learning Network. Bye now. Mm -hmm.